But today, the first part of the letter to the Philippians, basically the first two chapters. So five parts to today's session. It follows pretty much the structure, and so I come back to this. So the Philippians, uh, I already did a general introduction to all the letters and where it is written from, so I will not repeat that. It was most likely uh, written from a Roman prison, although it could have been written from an Ephesian prison as well. Philippi itself was an important town. It was uh, a Roman colony, and so it had um, uh, mostly Gentile Christians. Uh, not so much Jewish Christians, uh, but mostly Gentile Christians. Most citizens were descendants of Roman veterans. The conversion of the people in Philippi and, and the church being built there is quite well described and we find that in Acts 16. So you can just read Acts 16 and you can read pretty much about the start of the church in Philippi. So basically Paul and Silas were the ones that came to Philippi to preach the good news there during his second missionary journey. The first converts were affluent women and they continued to play an important part in the church. At some point, their mission came to kind of an abrupt end here because there was one girl that kind of did some fortune telling. She was under, under the influence of some spirit and she kept telling, oh, you must listen to St. Paul. And then it says that St. Paul was getting tired of it. He was exasperated by it. And so he just told her, in the name of Jesus, the spirit get out. And so she was uh, released. Uh, but then the owners of this girl who made money out of her prophesying got of course irritated because they lost their income so they started complaining against Paul and Silas and so they end up in prison a story I think that we all quite know because uh, this is the story where in prison they sing the praises of God and then uh, through an earthquake God releases the, their chains and releases the doors so uh, they can be free then the jailer the, the, the one in charge of the jail he thinks of taking his own life because he's afraid that all the prisoners have escaped. And Paul shouts to him, no, 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 we are all still here. So he, he, he brings in some light into the prison. He finds that they're all still there. And this leads then to the conversion of this jailer. Paul preaches the gospel to him and all his household. And him and all his households are baptized and are saved. And the city officials then ask them to leave. Uh, and Paul here already claiming his Roman citizen right actually because uh, as I told you last week uh, Paul had Roman citizen rights from birth and that's why he ended up uh, going to Rome but here already in in the prison in Philippi he speaks up for this right because if actually the city magistrates had known they couldn't have charged him like that without a, a proper Roman trial and so they ask him to leave and Paul then makes the demand and says, well, if you want me to leave, you have to come yourself to prison and escort me out. And so in other words, you have to own up to your mistake and, and, and publicly not, I, I will not leave in silence. So basically uh, the, the city officials had to come and lead them out of prison themselves. And then after visiting the brothers in Lydia's house, one of the first converts house, to encourage them, they left the town. They visited Philippi at least another two times during their third missionary journey. In other words, their contact with the Philippi community was very intense and was very close, which also then explains why the letter to the Philippi is, is such an intimate letter. It's uh, very personal and full of joy. When it comes to the structure of the letter, we have a little bit of difficulty and this is mainly because most scholars believe that the letter to the Philippi isn't really one letter but is made out of several letters then later grouped together made into one letter. So since that is likely the case, then structure is difficult to uh, be put into it. Now of course, we have the normal parts which is we have the address, we have the thanksgiving and we have a final greeting at the end. But the main body of the letter, the, the main message, which usually is first a doctrinal part followed by an exhortation of how to live a Christian life, isn't really found in this letter. The main body of the letter just kind of goes from a personal message to some exhortation to some personal message. It intersperses each other. So giving some structure to the letter as it presently is found. And so not so much a structure thought out by St. Paul when he wrote the letter, but rather just looking at the letter and finding the structure within it. We have an introductory part, which exists out of an address, thanksgiving, and personal news about Paul. Then the first exhortative part, 
which is a call to unity under persecution, to follow the humility of Christ and obedience as a witness to the world. And then the third part is an announcement of the travel plans of Timothy and Epaphroditus. Now, this part we will look into today. And so one, two, and three. And then next week we will look into four, five, six, seven, which is a, a polemic part, a final exhortations, thanksgiving, and the conclusion. Going into the text now itself, it starts with the address. Most other letters start with Paul calling himself apostle. Okay, Paul he always writes as an apostle, and so she, usually he writes that in his letterhead, Paul, an apostle, and an apostle appointed by Christ himself. Because obviously he wasn't one of the twelve. He was also not the twelfth one added to the eleven when Judas fell away. He is an apostle appointed by Jesus himself on the road to Damascus during his conversion encounter. And so he claims that title usually in his letters, but we don't find it here. Neither is Timothy called brother, as in other letters. So it, it, it keeps a very casual form. And this is likely explained because they knew him very well. Their relationship was so close that there was no real need for him to claim his title because they knew him. He, he was the apostle in charge of their community. Also, there isn't much tension in the letter. And some of the other letters, there, there is tension over disobedience. They don't really listen to him. They started listening to false teachers. So he had to claim back and make sure that they, they, they recognize his authority. Since that tension isn't really there, there is also no real need for Paul to claim that. So it is already understood. So it follows a quite frank uh, opening. Now, what is unique in this letter, which we don't find in any of the other Pauline letters, uh, is that he mentions the bishops and deacons of the church. So he makes a special mention together with the presiding in, in New Jerusalem Bible, it says presiding elders and deacons, uh, not a very good translation, basically uh, bishops and deacons, episcopoi and diaconos, deacons and bishops. Now, these are not function descriptions like leaders or shepherds, but they are rather really an official title of an office within the church. Now, of course, uh, it is unlikely that at this point they already had the full meaning of what a bishop and a deacon would have been in the second, third century of the church, uh, let alone what it means today. But it is already here uh, an official title, uh, and so it is used in that sense. How does that work? Now, the, the, the offices within the church make a certain development. Of course, the very first church was simply led by the apostles. The need for successors came along the way as they started on their missionary journeys and they couldn't stay in the same place all the time. So whenever they would travel on, they would appoint especially the presbyters, which we now call priests, to oversee the communities. This structure becomes more and more clear uh, as the apostle starts passing away, it becomes even more uh, official. There is a development in the church from a kind of a, a democratic governance under the guidance of the apostles who rule the church together to a more collegial governance by the presbyters and the bishops, the, the priests and bishops. They kind of form a team and they would look after the local communities to a more a development of a monarchic episcopate, meaning that a group of churches, a local church would be guided by one bishop who has the sole leadership of the church, which is the structure in some sense that we still have today. Not that there is no collegiality, of course there is still collegiality in the church, uh, because the bishops together, under the guidance of the Pope, who is the first among the bishops, leads the church uh, also together. Of course, in the end, uh, hierarchically, the, the Pope has the last say, just as in the diocese, the bishop has the last say. Now, of course, the bishop makes a lot of work in working together with his priest, because of course, as a bishop, he knows that he can't move anything in the diocese if his priests are not cooperating with him. And of course, technically they are on, under obedience, so they should just do what he says, but uh, we all know that life is a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean that they are disobedient, it simply means a human relationship has to be fostered and vision has to be well communicated. And so even in the early church that wasn't any different especially uh, because the, the apostles, the missionaries were traveling all the time and so they were often at a distance from the church that they were overseeing. So local churches would often be left to the presbyters uh, in the absence of the apostle, in the absence of the missionary. 
Presbyter, uh, the priest is actually not mentioned in this letter. In this letter, it's just mentioned the bishop and the deacon. Now, several scriptures show us that this authority was passed on by the laying of hands. And the laying of hands by the apostle on a presbyter, on a bishop, uh, would pass on that authority to him. And basically, this is uh, what we call ordination. And he is brought to the order of and to the order of authority in which he can then function. In the early church, it may not have just been that the bishop was the overseer and the priests were under him, then it becomes a later development. Uh, in the beginning, it may have just been more working together. The bishops were in charge of uh, the mysterial teaching, the discipline, the administration, the pastoral care, the charity, and uh, the priests and the deacons would help him in this task. It's only uh, 215 onwards that uh, the deacon really becomes a liturgical function. If you read Acts of the Apostle, I think it's chapter 7, it's first mention of deacons because the apostles basically, they get a lot of requests over financial matters because they all own everything in common. So how is money divided among the widowers and so on. So it got complex. So the apostle said, maybe we get deacons to look into this matter, look after this. Else, all our time goes into that, but actually our task is to preach the gospel. So that was the first task of the deacon. And even until today, that, that should be the main task of the deacon is to look into the charity of the church. Yeah, works of charity, looking after the needy, the sick, even financial matters. Now, from 215 onwards, it also becomes a liturgical function. The deacon helps the priest in the liturgical celebrations. And the bishop being the sole leader of the diocese and the priest being under him, we see this first under Ignatius of Antioch, who died in 107 AD. And so it's not long before this development takes clear shape. Catechism, the Catholic Church, 1556, this is part of the rite of ordination, and so it speaks about uh, the imposing of hands to uh, transmit the gift of the Spirit for the consecration. And then uh, in the footnote is mentioned the reference where St. Paul lays hands on Timothy. So uh, Timothy was made a bishop by Paul by the laying on hands. The image here is an image of that. And this letter is written by Paul and Timothy together. Later, Timothy will take charge of the Ephesian church. The next verses from 3 to 11 uh, is the thanksgiving part of the letter. Traditionally, a letter will start with a part of thanksgiving. Uh, and this is usually thanksgiving for the fate of the community. And in the Pauline letters, it takes a form of a prayer. Here, however, he doesn't really thank God for the fate of the Philippian Christians, but he thanks them for them sharing in the spreading of the gospel, how they help him, how they have become partners in the gospel. It starts with, I thank my God at every remembrance of you, praying always with joy at every prayer for all of you. And so basically he remembers them all the time in his prayers. This is his spirituality. Now all the italic words, every, always, every, all, all in Greek start with a P. And so it, it, it forms a literary style that adds emphasis and emotional value to how much he prays for them. And he calls God, my God. Of course, it is our God, but it is a very personal relationship. Also, in the start of this letter, here is the first time that joy is mentioned. And joy is a word that will come back over and over again in this letter. This is the most joyful letter of the New Testament. So, they were partners in the gospel, in the spreading. Now, this partnership, how it is exactly to be understood, isn't totally explained, but it probably means that they had a spiritual partnership as well as a material partnership, uh, meaning they, they materially provided for Paul. Paul had such a close relationship with the Philippians community that this was the only community from whom he accepted money. For the rest, he, uh, he made his own money as a tent maker, uh, but from this community, uh, he took support from them, which basically was a good sign. Uh, meaning that he thought highly of them and therefore he accepted money from them, meaning that they were mature enough to know that uh, the one who spreads the gospel is also worthy of support for doing this work. But he didn't accept it from other communities so that they will not think bad of him and that it will not become an obstacle of him preaching the gospel. So they supported him, uh, even in prison they would have given him some money for his uh, survival. And so they supported him in that way. They also supported in a spiritual way by helping out in preaching the gospel and also by suffering with Paul for the gospel. 
And so this suffering with, this compassion suffering with was a, an important part also of sharing the partnership of the gospel. Verse 6 says, I am quite confident that the one who has begun a good work in you will continue on completing it until the day of Jesus Christ. And the day of Jesus Christ, of course, is at the final day when Jesus returns. A very nice phrase, if you go to any of the ordination of priest, deacon or bishop, uh, this verse is always quoted. After they take their vows, after they, they express their vows to the bishop, the bishop then will say, and may God who begin this good work in you and bring it to completion. And so we always recognize that God begins the work. God begins the work of grace and he always takes the initiative. So this is an important element for our understanding of salvation. God always takes the initiative. He does it through grace. But it is not just a one-off event. It is an ongoing sanctification. This is where our Catholic theology differs from Protestant theology, which thinks that salvation is a one-off event. And that's why the street evangelists will ask you, are you saved? Or when did you accept Jesus? If you say yes, then when did you? It is a one-off event. You accepted Jesus, you are saved, that's it. Jesus covers you, God doesn't look at your sin anymore, you remain the same sinner, uh, but you are saved because of Jesus. Uh, for us Catholics, we say, no, I am saved by Jesus, it is a gift, I can't do it by myself, but as He has saved me, He will then ongoingly save me. And finally, I will be saved. So for us, salvation happens in three times. I am saved, I will be saved, and in between, I am being saved. It is an ongoing process of sanctification of God uh, transforming me and uh, especially in, in the Pauline letters and especially in this letter uh, this work of ongoing salvation is very clear to St. Paul. We will see it uh, several times in today's teaching. God will continue that work. And St. Augustine nicely says, God who created you without your cooperation will not save you without your cooperation. And He may have made you without your choice, but salvation will require your cooperation. It is a transformation, a making holy of your life. In our daily faith life, we need to go back to the sacrament of confession over and over again, because we don't make the mark yet, we are not holy yet, we know that we are still sinners in need of salvation, in need to come on our knees and ask God for a fresh start again, ask Him for His forgiveness. Verse 8, 9, Paul says, I love you like Christ does. Uh, and so therefore you must also then grow in love for one another and not just in love for Christ but also in love for one another uh, Paul preaches this communal dimension to the faith don't just believe in God uh, but you must also therefore then be united in the faith unity is an important element also of this letter the call to unity verse 10 and 11 here we see this process of sanctification that I just spoke about I'll just read it first from the scriptures. That will help you to come to true discernment so that you will be innocent and free of any trace of guilt when the day of Christ comes, entirely filled with the fruits of our brightness through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. Now, innocence isn't something that we can achieve by ourselves because by the fall, we are not innocent. We are all fallen. So innocence becomes a gift. And this is the initial gift of grace, the initial gift of salvation. God needs to make us innocent. And this gift is transferred to us through the sacrament of baptism, and through which we were made clean, and innocence is restored to us. But of course, it's not easy to maintain that innocence, and so that becomes the process, the process of sanctification. And so, after the word innocence, to be free from any trace of guilt. And that is the ongoing journey in verse 11 entirely filled with the fruits of uprightness uprightness isn't just merely a, a one-off gift but it is a fruit it is something that grows it grows in our life we become more and more holy now this work of growing in holiness isn't a work that is done on our own strength but it is done through Jesus Christ. So again, even the process of sanctification in which we have to cooperate is still the work of Jesus, is still the work of grace. And so we are justified by Him, we are sanctified also by Him in this work of cooperation with Him. The third part to the introduction part is now personal news about Paul. And so here he speaks about him being in prison. Uh, we spoke a little bit about it last week, that he mentions that him being in chains 
is actually uh, bringing about some good because it helps the advance of the gospel. Because his chains are well known, so it is a really a testimony uh, that he is willing to be imprisoned for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of believing in the resurrection. And uh, in verse 14 it says that brothers uh, are gaining confidence because of it and they start preaching also fearlessly because I did and they are encouraged by it. And so it is bringing about some good. Verse 15 to 17 then makes mention of uh, that some do it out of good motives, others do it out of bad motives. He puts this in a chiasm, basically a crossing, so A, A, B, B, so the segments cross. Some preach out of envy, others preach out of goodwill, the one who love, the others proclaim it out of rivalry and for their own motives. Now Paul, he simply rejoices in it. They may do it to add to his chains, maybe to bring some discredit to him, saying that maybe he is in prison over minor matters. Maybe it is because they do it out of evil intention to gain power. And so maybe Paul then loses that control and that may bring about disunity. So in that way, they may add to the weight of his chains. And what that verse exactly means is, is not entirely clear. But whether Christ is preached out of good motives or bad motives, Paul simply says, I rejoice in it because what is most important is that Christ is proclaimed. So maybe we also can learn from it for ourselves that checking our motives is important and then we always should have right motives in doing things but if checking our motives reaches the point of not doing anything then maybe we, we have brought it a step too far. Don't stop proclaiming Christ, don't stop evangelizing, don't think uh, I wait till I have enough formation, till I'm good enough, till I, I, I know my Bible well enough, just simply start. Whether with good motives or bad motives, uh, most important is that Christ is proclaimed. And in that fact, uh, Paul rejoices. Of course, they do proclaim the true gospel. They are not the false preachers that he speaks of later. Because if that were the case, he would surely have not rejoiced in it. He doesn't rejoice over a spreading of a false gospel. And he rejoices over the right gospel being proclaimed uh, by people who may do it out of wrong motives. And actually, it is Jesus himself already that gives us this instruction. And when they find uh, some people working miracles in the name of Jesus, the apostles, and they complain to Jesus, he say, you should not stop them. No one who works a miracle in my name could soon afterwards speak evil of me. Anyone who is not against us is for us. So let's work together. And then in verse 19, 20, and I shall go on being happy too, because I know that this is what will save me. Again, we have here a, a glimpse of Paul understanding that salvation is a journey. This is what will save me. Of course, Paul is already saved. Paul had already accepted Christ. He was already an apostle. Uh, he had already uh, been baptized. Uh, but he knows that this is what will save me. So what is it that will save him? Of course, for Paul, what will save him is the death and resurrection of Jesus and faith in Jesus. But what will bring about this transformation in his life is... And the proclamation of God, his, his evangelical zeal, joy in suffering. Suffering is an element that will help us grow in holiness. Hope and trust and, and allowing God to be glorified in my body, whether alive or dead. And so in my life and in my giving of life and when I pass on. This life, death, these two words in verse 20 form a bridge to the next section. 21 to 26, which speaks about life and death. Very interesting segment of this first chapter. Paul speaks of his situation, being in prison, and, and now he speaks about living or dying. Should I go on living or should I go on dying? Now, it could be that he is aware that uh, maybe his trial is soon coming to a verdict. Uh, which could lead to his execution. Therefore, he knows that death could be at hand. It could also be that he is released. So, uh, this is not really a choice that Paul has. He's not asking himself, should I keep on uh, breathing or should I take my own life? Nothing like that at all. He's simply contemplating the two options that are ahead of him by a choice by others. Uh, he's either going to be released or he's going to be executed. And so he wonders, which option do I actually prefer? What do I hope for? Maybe even what do I pray for? And that the outcome of the verdict will be. And so this is his struggle. He calls it dilemma. This is my dilemma eh, in verse 23. Now, he starts with this premises. He says, life for me is Christ. 
Living for me is Christ. Christ is the essence of my life. It is the reason for my life. It is what has given me life. And it is what I live for. And I think that that is the most important truth of this first chapter of Philippians. Christ is my life. And I think we have to ask ourselves this question. Is Christ my life? Is Christ my everything? Is Christ my all in all? Is it the reason why I wake up in the morning? Is it the reason why I go to work? Is it the reason for me to love my family, my friends? Is it the reason of my mission in life? The reason of my prayer? Is it what I long for? Paul, this was his conviction. He lived all his life to follow Christ. And he made that the sole purpose of his life. Christ to him was everything. We see that life, death, life, death uh, will, will continue to uh, the, the bold ones. Life, death, life, gone is death, and then a life again. So he stylistically puts it very nice by alternating them. If life for me is Christ, then death would be gain. In other words, I'm living on earth to finally be with Christ fully in heaven. Here I still see him in shadows, there I will see him face to face. And he is still in the mirror there face to face. So that would be much greater. He knows that heaven is a better option than uh, life on earth. And so if life for me is Christ, then death would be gain. But on the other hand, if I'm alive, then I have an opportunity to spread the good news. I have an opportunity to do good work among you to encourage you. And so this is the dilemma. I want to be gone. Eh? I want to die and be with Christ. This is the far stronger desire. He recognizes this is what he really, really wants. And he's honest about it. This is what he really wants. But for the sake of them, for their sake, to stay alive is the much more urgent need. He recognizes that he is still needed. And they still need his help. They still need his support. And so this is what he then will pray for. Eh? That he will stay on so that he can return to them and encourage them eh, for the advance and the joy of their faith. I guess that uh, this is a very nice model uh, given to us uh, for discernment. Even though it wasn't a full discernment for Paul because he didn't have a choice to make. And discernment is when we have a choice to make. Uh, but still I think that it, it reveals something of uh, what discernment is about. And I'm sure that St. Ignatius in his way of discernment was inspired by this letter to the Philippians. First of all, the sermon must always be a choice, and it must be a choice between two goods. We never discern between good and bad. You don't need to pray, should I do good or should I do bad? You don't need to pray about that, just do good. And the sermon can only about two good options. Should I take out this job or that job? And if both jobs are good jobs, and then you can discern. It must be two good choices. And the way that St. Ignatius teaches us how to discern is by seeing the movements, the interior movements of our heart. That's why I think that this passage is interesting because Paul describes his interior movements. And later on, he, in 2 verse 1, he again says, If in Christ there is anything that moves you, and the movements of the heart. In Paul we see two movements, the stronger desire and, and the more urgent need, which in essence is the selfless one, the one that makes him wants to make a gift of himself. Actually, in Ignatian discernment, we should follow the strong desire. The strong desire is a good thing, and not at all should we actually place them against each other. It's just that in the concreteness of this situation, the more urgent need is the more important one. But the strong desire essentially is not his desire to die, but is his desire to make sure that life is Christ, that he lives close to God, and that too should be our desire, our way of life. And so, tracking the movements of our heart, these strong movements, these urgent needs that we see, that makes us want to be selfless, are often signals of what God wants us to do in life. Of course, uh, this is what we then need to pray through, and, and with the help of a spiritual director, we can make spirit-led decisions. <music> next part, the first exhortation, uh, the exhortative part, and it starts with uh, speaking for unity while under persecution. You should only live a life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, whether seen or not seen, whether I see you or don't see you. Uh, in other words, they should live a life of integrity. They should be firm and united, working together for the faith of the gospel. Even though they are opponents, they may be persecuted, they should not be intimidated. 
So they should stand firm, they should be united. The call for unity under persecution. For Christians, persecution has become a sign of election. Then I am on the right way. The Beatitudes uh, teaches that already. Uh, if, we are, if you are persecuted, uh, that is a good thing. The kingdom of God is yours. On the other hand, persecuting, oppressing the Christian faith will lead to condemnation, will lead to being lost. This is basically one interpretation of these verses. It speaks about uh, the Christians being saved, the persecutors being lost. Certainly a valid uh, way of looking at this verse. In the Old Testament, however, the view of, of people in the Old Testament was quite different. It viewed suffering as a punishment by God, meaning if you see suffering in your life, then surely you did something wrong. And so the opponents of the Christians, which were mainly the Jews, they may have had this view. You are suffering because you are doing something wrong. It is a sign that you are not with God. For the Christians, that view had totally changed. Suffering because ultimately Jesus himself suffered for us and became a good sign, a sign of doing the will of God. And so we can also literally translate uh, verse 28, which to them is truly proof of destruction, but to you of salvation. Now, it could be that this destruction refers to the destruction of the persecutors, but it could also be seen as meaning that for the persecutors, they see this suffering as you are on the wrong track, you, are, you will be destroyed. But for us, we know that it is not. And so it, it could also be simply a viewpoint on the same group, which is the group of Christians. Chapter 2. The first five verses are an introduction to the hymn that we will soon be discussing. If in Christ there is anything that will move you, any incentive of love, any fellowship in the Spirit, any warmth or sympathy, then make my joy complete. And basically, again, he calls here to the call of unity. Paul knowing that sharing the same faith in Christ doesn't automatically make you united. He, he has seen this unity in uh, the communities and uh, throughout his missionary journeys and his apostolic life. And so uh, you should be united in the Spirit. Verse 3 and 4 specify this way to unity. How can we attain unity? Two ways. You should give preference to others rather than working for your own glory. And you should put the interests of others ahead of your selfish interests. So basically, move from inward looking to outward looking. That is the best way to build unity. Verse 5 mentions Jesus Christ, which then becomes the introduction to the hymn itself. Verse 6 starts with, who though he was in the form of God, and so who is the Jesus Christ mentioned in verse 5? So that makes the bridge. Basically the call is, make your own the mind of Christ. Put on the mind of Christ, be like Christ. And then comes this hymn, and this hymn basically speaks of the humility of Christ. The term that we often use for this uh, comes from this hymn, which is the word kenosis, the self-emptying. And this Greek word kenosis, I think an important word to remember, uh, kenosis, the self-emptying. It is the call to the kenosis. It is commonly accepted that uh, this uh, hymn was already a hymn in the church. It likely would have grown in one of the Pauline churches, and so here he inserts it into his letter. He may have adapted it a little bit, he may have added some words to it, but it is a hymn that already existed, he put it into his letter. It could be but we can't prove it that maybe he wrote it himself earlier, but it may have been written by others. Because of time, I will skip some slides. Uh, this one simply uh, explains why it is an insertion, how from the text we can see that it is an insertion. Now, if you look at the text of the hymn, you will see that it is normally divided into two parts, which are each divided into three segments. So there are three stanzas, three verses, which are each three lines. But you will see that the first C has four lines. And so this even death on the cross is a likely insertion because it breaks the rhythm of the hymn. And it is a very Pauline saying that he wanted to add uh, to the hymn. And this is a likely interpretation. Now, there are two differing views on what the hymn is really speaking about. And it depends very much on how you interpret verse 6 and 7. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be exploited, but emptied himself. Is this speaking about the pre-existence of God? Is this speaking about the word that later on becomes flesh? Is, is this speaking about God in eternity, who then becomes flesh into time? Is it speaking about this reality? 
or is the hymn from the very start already about the incarnate Jesus, the God who already became man? Of course, we are not talking about a theological difference. We all believe that Jesus pre-existed, and that, that the Word was there before becoming flesh, that the Son of God existed before becoming flesh and be called Jesus. And from this text, that, that can even be proven. That reality is implicitly proven in this text. If he did not regard equality as something to be grasped, and that means he already existed and before time. And he was in the form of God because he was God, and so he pre-existed. So there are these two views. One is uh, the view that this hymn is about, and the first part is about the pre-existence of the word. The other one is that the whole hymn speaks already about Jesus being in the flesh. And then the hymn is more a comparison with Adam. So the direct interpretation of the hymn changes whether uh, you hold this view or that view. Now, that it is the divine pre-existence is the view of pretty much all the church fathers. So throughout church history, this has always been the view that the hymn is about this. Why did the church fathers see it in this way is because they had used this text in all of their discussions, especially against the Arian heresy, which said that uh, Jesus is not God. And so this text became part of that debate. And so obviously they interpreted in it like that and they always explain it like that. However, modern exegesis, which likes to look at the text on its own, if we look at the text itself without all this historical debate around it, and just look at the text and what would have Paul intended to write, then actually the Adamic interpretation is the more likely one. It's not whether either one is wrong or right, but it's probably that the second one is the more likely intention of St. Paul. It makes a difference on how then we interpret words. First one, the equality with God. Now the equality with God, the word, the Greek word used here can be interpreted in two ways. One is as something to be held on to, or it could mean as something to be grasped at. Something to hold on to or something to take. Now if it is about the divine pre-existence, then we would translate this word as he did not hold on to it. If it is the Adamic interpretation, then we would say it is not something that he wanted to take after. Because Adam, who was made in the image and likeness of God, was tempted by the devil, by the snake, because he said, if you eat from this fruit, then you will be like God. So he tried to grasp after being like God. And so and then that link would be made. Verse 7, he emptied himself at the kenosis. Now, what is this kenosis about? If it is about the divine pre-existence, then the kenosis would be about the incarnation that he emptied himself from being God in heaven, he became human. Of course, he remained God, but became human. That is the kenosis. If we take the Adamic interpretation, then the kenosis is the contrast between human arrogance versus the humility of Christ. And he emptied himself that even though he was God, he did not claim divine majesty. He did not claim to be treated with divine respect. And so he was born uh, in a simple way, the suffering of life and, and the rejection of life. He did not claim his divine dignity, even though he was, of course, God. So depending on whatever view the composer of your Bible had, and probably they will also divide the verses differently. They will either divide it into three parts, which then speaks about the incarnation, then the crucifixion, then the exaltation, or if they follow the Adamic interpretation, then they will divide it into two parts with uh, three stanzas each, which is the structure that I will follow for this lesson. So yeah, it has two parts. It corresponds in a chiastic way. Though he was in the form of God, A, at the end, he will be declared, Jesus is Lord. Now, Lord here uh, means he is God. And so, though he was God, and he did not crown equality as something to be hold on to, as something to be grasped, at the end, he is given the name of Lord. He is God. B, he emptied himself, so he became humble, and he became low. Verse 10, the corresponding part, every knee will bend for him. And every, so he is given back the glory that he actually deserves. See, he humbled himself, the corresponding part, God exalted him.
we also see that this verse ends with human likeness, then this verse starts with human form. So uh, again, uh, this links them. And here it speaks about name. The next one also speaks about name. So this is the literary form of the structure of this hymn uh, that links things together. Of course, the kenosis should not be understood and should not be misinterpreted that God ceased to be God. Because that is simply an impossibility. Jesus always remained God. Though he became human, he remained fully God. It is just that he did not claim uh, the dignity of it, uh, the, the, the exterior form of glory and honor. He wasn't born in a palace. Uh, he was born in a stable. He did not claim the dignity of it, the honor of it. That is the first emptying, the first kenosis. He did not claim that dignity. The second kenosis, the humbling, is that and he even accepted suffering. Suffering which was the result of the fall, the result of Adam's fall, suffering entered the world. He embraced suffering, even to the point of death. And he became obedient. Again, this fits very well in the Adamic view uh, that uh, Christ as the antithesis to Adam, he is the new Adam, which is a very Pauline idea. Adam was the first disobedient one which led to suffering. Christ now accepts suffering, but he makes this suffering redemptive because it is not a suffering that comes from disobedience, but it is one that follows from full obedience to God. So this obedience, of course, is an obedience to the Father. Humbling himself and emptying himself is also not just an action done on its own. It is done for something. You empty yourself for something else. This emptying, this kenosis is done for something and this something is us. It is done for us. It is an emptying that is done so that He can redeem us. So this is really the heart of the charisma, the heart of the gospel that Paul preached and that Jesus died on a cross to save us. He did it for us. And because He did so, therefore God exalted Him. You see, verse 5 said that we should put on the mind of Christ, we should be humble like Christ. But of course, this hymn isn't just about humility. It isn't just like a, an inspiration to be humble. This hymn itself is really about salvation. This is the way that Christ saves us. That and He emptied Himself, He became like one of us, in everything like us except in sin. The sin of Adam led to suffering, led to death. The obedience of Jesus leads to life, but He chooses death so that we can take life in Him. And that is the heart of the Gospel. And so, the turning point, verse 9, Therefore God exalted Him. Therefore God raised Him up. The hymn doesn't make explicit mention of the resurrection, but here the exaltation, which is already more, uh, the raising to heaven, of course, uh, implies also the resurrection. God exalted Him and gave Him the name. Now the name here, the, the name isn't Jesus, the name is Lord. The name is that Jesus is Lord. Now in the Old Testament, I think I explained this during the prophet Ezekiel, that in the Old Testament, the word used for God is YHWH. Now, the Jews don't pronounce that name of God because else we, we kind of claim to have ownership over God or, or control over God. So out of respect for God, they omit saying the unmentionable name of God. And so instead of saying the name of God, whenever a Jewish boy in, in, in the synagogue will read the scroll and he comes across this word, he will say Adonai, which means in Hebrew, Lord. And so the Greek Old Testament writes Kurios, Lord. That is exactly the word used here, that Jesus is the Lord. And so for any first century Jew, it is very clear that saying that Jesus is the Lord means saying He is God. He is God. And that is the name by which we are saved. Romans 10 verse 9 says, If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. This is the name by which we will be saved. And so this is quite likely also a, a liturgical phrase. That's why they use the word confess. And Jesus is Lord. Is, it may have been something that they used in the liturgy. And so <clears throat> He is exalted. Now, exalted, again, uh, this hymn is about salvation. It, it is a soteriological hymn. It is a hymn about salvation. So, 
Of course, it speaks about Jesus being exalted, but beyond just saying that Jesus is exalted, it actually says something about us. This exaltation reveals to us that the order of redemption, the order of grace, is higher than the order of sin. It is even higher than the order of creation. Meaning that if Adam, who was made just, was made in the image and likeness of God, was at this level, and then because of sin descended to this level, now when we are saved, we are not just brought back to this level, we are brought back beyond. We are even brought to a higher level. When we were saved, when we were baptized, we were at a higher plan than Adam ever was at the moment before the fall. The state of salvation is a higher state because we are not just made in the image and likeness of God, but we, we have become children of God. God makes a share in His own life. That's why heaven is better than paradise. Heaven is better than what the Garden of Eden was about. And that's why the salvation of Jesus isn't plan B. He would have always come to raise us to this next level. To make a share in the divine life of God. To make us children of God. This exaltation. So this exaltation isn't just only speaking about Jesus. It's speaking about the grace made available to us in Him. That we will share in this exaltation. And so He's given her the name of Lord. And so in His name the name of Jesus as Lord, and we will be saved, and this salvation is made available to us. So to end this section with a, with a pun, this hymn isn't so much about the pre-existence, it is rather about the pro-existence. In other words, it isn't so much, even though of course it proves it and it is about it in some way, that the Word existed in eternity ever before becoming flesh, but this hymn isn't so much about saying that, it is much more about saying that God is there for us. The pro-existence, He came down for us, pro nobis, as we say in the creed. For us men and for our salvation, He came down from heaven. And He came for us. And that is the message of the gospel, that God comes close to us to redeem us. The last part of the exhortative part speaks about obedience. Again, when I'm around or when I'm not around, be obedient. The obedience to God should be made concrete in the obedience to leaders. And of course, this continues to count even for us. And that's why uh, obedience to our parish priest, obedience to our bishop is important uh, in our faith. The collaboration together, obedience is important. Verse 12, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. As I already mentioned earlier, Paul was very aware that salvation isn't a one-off event. It is an ongoing journey and therefore you should work it out with fear and trembling. Not so much fear as being afraid, but rather the fear of the Lord. Awe and wonder of God, knowing that He is beyond us and our life is in His hands. And so how does this salvation work out? How should we work out our salvation? It is made concrete in verse 13, 14, 15. 13 says, the grace which God gives is both the intention and the power to act. Being saved is, first of all, the grace of God. And what is that grace that God gives us? He gives us the intention to do good. And not just the intention, but He also gives us the power to do it. And that is grace. We want to do the good thing, that is the first step. We no longer want to do the bad thing. We no longer desire sin. We, we long for virtue. We long for goodness but He also gives us the power to do so. And so we should be free from complaining, we should be free from negativity, and we should be free from sin. We should move away from negativity, we should move away from sin, so that we can be pure and holy in Him. And if we become pure and holy in Him, then we become bright shining stars, and then become a living witness to the world around us. As I said, this hymn is full of joy, and so he said, I shall be glad and join in your rejoicing in the same way. You should be glad and join in my rejoicing. It is a sharing in the rejoicing that we have in the Lord. The final part of today's session is uh, the announcement of the travel plans of Timothy and of Epaphroditus. It basically comes in three parts. First, I'm sending Timothy. Then a middle verse that says, I hope I am coming myself. 
and then I'm sending Epaphroditus. So there's two paths with slotting in between. Uh, I hope that I'm coming myself, and by now uh, he has this hope that he will be released from prison soon. It's like concentric. It starts with, I'm sending Timothy to hear how you are, and it ends with, I will send uh, Epaphroditus as soon as I know how I am. And so basically it's an, it's an exchange of knowing how each other is doing, it's an exchange of love. I want to know how you are doing and I want to share with you how I am doing. So he sends Timothy, I spoke about uh, him already last week, he was very dear to him, he was like a son and he authentically cooperated with Paul. Epaphroditus was one that was sent by the Philippians to help Paul, but because he became sick and he nearly died, they must have worried about him. Now he's sending him back to comfort them. The structure quite interesting. It starts with saying that he is your representative. He is the one you send to minister to my needs. And it ends with uh, the duty that you couldn't do yourself. Uh, and that's why he did it on your behalf. And then the middle parts is more parallel. I will send him to you. I will send him back to you. He nearly died. He nearly died. And basically Paul asked him to hold him in honor, and people like him in honor, welcome him back. He nearly died. It isn't just a mere physical fact, but he did it for the work of Christ. It is a spiritual fact, and therefore you should honor him. Now, the question is, if you divide Philippians into two parts, whether it ends simply with the last verse of chapter 2, verse 30, or whether it ends with the first half of 3, 1, which is the choice that I followed, because the first part of verse 1 of the church chapter says, Finally, brothers, I wish you join in the Lord. So this finally could mean that this is still the last part of this section. It could also mean the introduction of the next part, the final part. Different uh, scholars make different choices where to place this verse. But in the end, again, it is a callback to the joy in the Lord. Seven points we talked about today. For seven take-homes, we should have a spiritual and material partnership in spreading the gospel. We should be involved spiritually. We should do the work. We should also support the work materially by our giving. Paul let his situation in prison be an advance to the gospel. And I think we should also let our own situation, however good or bad it is, become an advantage to the spreading of the gospel. Paul says, life to me is Christ. I hope it is to us as well. It was a call to unity of Christians in heart, mind, and spirit. We should imitate the humility of Christ, the kenosis. We should work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And salvation is an ongoing journey. And Paul on and on reminds us to be joyful in the Lord. So let's end with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. And even though a lot of teams come and go and exchange each other, we thank you, Lord, that you want to inspire through each of these single messages. Lord, help us to take our journey of salvation serious, to make work of our salvation, to allow your grace to transform us. Give us that gift of joy as we are on this journey of conversion. And help us by this joy then to become a witness to the people around us. Lord, may we become more and more aware that life is Christ. Lord, may we live for you, may we live in you from you and towards you. We make this prayer to Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, thank you everyone. We'll see you next week.